let me ask you, just to that point, if you were uh, representing the defense here, would you advise your client, Mr. Rittenhouse, to take the stand? Craig, 100%. I think that whenever you kill someone and you're claiming that you were justified or that you weren't setting out with lethal intent to kill someone, you almost have to take the stand. The problem with this case, and this builds off what Greg is saying, is that legally they've got Kyle Rittenhouse. And that's made very clear, especially with the way people are interpreting Grosskreutz's testimony from yesterday. But the juries don't care about the law. Trials are about storytelling. And the way this is tilting lets you know that Rittenhouse has to take the stand and say, listen, yes, I shot these people. I killed two of them, but I did it in self-defense. Without that, his lawyers can't pound that home in their closing arguments. David, the medical examiner uh, is right now talking about some of the wounds that he observed on the, the men who were killed. Uh, he said Anthony Huber died from a gunshot wound to the chest. Here's one exchange. And were you able to determine the cause of death to Mr. Huber? Yes. And what was that cause of death? Uh, Mr. Huber died from a gunshot wound to the chest. And is that an opinion given to with a reasonable degree of medical certainty? It is. Why, why are those details so important, David? Well, Craig, here's the issue with medical examiners generally. We always think of John Quincy uh, MD or CSI, and most of them are not like that. They spend their days in a cold room dealing with cadavers, and their personalities tend to reflect that. You want to call them in to do exactly what he did, just establish what the immediate cause of death was. The reason why it's important is because Kyle Rittenhouse actually showed a high degree of skill with his rifle. It's clear that he was shooting for center mass. He was shooting with lethal intent, and that's why he killed the two people that he did. This testimony plays directly into that so that you can argue it that way during closing arguments. Based on, David, what you've seen and heard so far, again, uh, important to note here that we have not heard from the defense yet, but, I mean, what do you make of the case that the prosecution has made so far? You know, Craig, what I make of this more than anything else is poor witness preparation of Grosskreutz yesterday. It should have come as no surprise that he approached Kyle Rittenhouse with a gun. It should have come as no surprise that the jury might interpret that as being aggressive. And let me tell you why that's a problem. If you had an active scooter shooter in a school and a teacher raised a gun at that shooter, no one would think, oh, the teacher's in the wrong. You'd immediately know the teacher was in the right to defend the students against the active shooter. But for some reason, people didn't see Grosskreutz that way when he testified yesterday, who are watching the trial from the outside. You had a situation where Rittenhouse is running down the street with a gun. People are pointing at him saying, hey, he shot those people. He shot those people. Under those circumstances, Grosskreutz was justified in using lethal force, but the people watching the trial don't see it that way. And that perception is what carries the day with the jury. And that's what makes me concerned about the outcome of this case. David Henderson, uh, we'll leave it there with you. Thank you, sir. Gabe, keep us posted on the trial itself. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez on the ground force there in Kenosha. All